All right. Are you guys ready to hear the word tonight? Yes. 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 All right. I'm going to change it over to, okay, now I can see everybody and not just myself. Um, but I'm excited, you guys. I have a little lesson for you tonight. Obviously, that's what I usually have prepared for you. Um, but I'm really excited because kind of where this lesson came about is uh, just in my quiet times and what I was reading actually this morning, I had a totally different idea of what I wanted to preach about. Then I don't know. I don't know if you guys have ever been in your quiet time and you kind of start like you read one thing and then you research another thing and then that leads you down another trail. And all of a sudden you're like fully down the rabbit hole and you were on a completely different topic than you started. But it's sometimes the best thing ever. Sometimes it's super distracting. Sometimes it's exactly what you needed to hear. And that's what happened this morning. And it all started this morning. Uh, I got so caught up in my rabbit hole. I was supposed to read these like four different chapters, started with Proverbs chapter two, and that's where it all began. So why don't you guys turn with me? Let's, let's get this thing started with Proverbs chapter two. And when we get over there, give me an amen when you get there. And we're going to be starting in verse one. Can I get an amen? Anybody there? Amen. 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 All right, let's get started. So in Proverbs chapter two, starting in verse one, it says, my son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And as I was reading this, um, there was one phrase in this section that stood out to me. Um, I was definitely, I, I kept getting caught up in a lot of different things as I was going through Proverbs 2. It's a, it's a really awesome section of scripture just to teach you a lot about wisdom and maturity and where our hearts need to be. But there was this phrase it says in verse two, applying your heart to understanding. And I don't know why, but that phrase really stuck out to me, applying your heart to understanding. And I was looking up, so you can, you can use uh, many resources to go and look up what was the original Hebrew word that they had here. And I looked up what was the Hebrew word for, where, for applying. And it's this word nata, which means to stretch to bend or extend, right? And applying our hearts to understanding essentially means stretching ourselves or bending ourselves on a heart level to what God has said and why he has said it, right? Because it's one thing to understand what God is calling us to do, but it's another thing to understand why God is calling us to do it on a heart level, right? And I think I thought of Jesus when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was praying on his knees before he was about to go to the cross. Many of us, as we, we do the cross Bible study, and for those of you who are studying the Bible, you'll get there soon enough. Um, we look at Jesus during this moment and he knew what was laying before him, um, that he was about to be tortured. He was about to be falsely accused. He was going to be nailed to the cross and he didn't want to do it. He actually asked God to take it away. He asked God not to go there. And so before that moment, he was, while he was sharing his heart with God, he prayed for three hours, it's believed, possibly even more. And in his prayer, he was stretching and bending his heart to the will of God so that his actions would follow his heart. The power in bending or stretching ourselves as a heart, at a heart level is that you don't even have to know what God's plan is to be on board with it. And that's what we totally see in Jesus. His heart had changed to the point of him being ready for anything that would come his way. Even the parts of God's plan that he wasn't prepared for. And he was prepared for almost all of it. We see in other gospels outside of Matthew that when Jesus was communicating with his disciples before this moment, he was pretty clear on what was going to go down. He knew he was going to be arrested. He knew who was going to betray him. He knew he was going to be falsely accused, that he was going to be tortured, that he was going to be nailed to a cross. So he was, he, he knew a lot of it, but there were certain parts that he wasn't prepared for, especially at the end. 
But because he had changed his heart, he was ready for anything that was going to come his way. Um, this happened because God's will had truly become Jesus's will at this point, right? Jesus's will, if God's will was for Jesus to die on the cross, which we know that that was God's will for him, because without that death on the cross, we wouldn't have an opportunity with the relation for a relationship with God right now. And in Jesus's prayer in the garden of Gethsemane, he made his will to die on the cross. And because his heart changed at that level, he stretched himself and he bent himself in that way. He wasn't going to stop himself from getting to the cross. He was going to get to the cross by any means necessary. And that's what it looks like to change our hearts or stretch ourselves or bend ourselves to having the heart of God. And I think this idea of being stretched or pressed or bent and essentially molded made me think of how we truly are clay in the hands of God, right? This is all the things that we do with clay as we're molding it into different vessels. If you think of the process that clay has to go through to become a proper vessel, it's first strategically pressed and softened and made increasingly more flexible, right? Then it's molded into the proper form in order to fulfill the creator's purpose for it, right? Then it's dried and glossed and put through the fire to refine it and solidify its form. And finally, it's put to the test through being used for its intended purpose. And so my lesson for you guys tonight, the title is In the Hands of the Potter. And I want us to start off our lesson in Jeremiah chapter 18. Come on, Devin. This is awesome. My first point for you guys tonight is molded by his hand. In Jeremiah chapter 18, we're going to start off in verse one. And the Bible reads, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. So I went to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best for him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. And uh, for those that missed it, that was Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. And I think when I first look at this scripture, I admittedly, it's a little difficult to read, right? Because he says that this potter had this piece of clay that was marred and messed up. But then it says that the potter molded it into and shaped it into what seemed best to him. And I think when I read that, I'm like, okay, so I immediately think, so God's shaping me into what seems best for him. But what if I don't think that that's what's best for me, you know? And I can immediately start to get defensive or start to have this heart. And I think the thought of trusting God, even if what he was preparing me or creating me for was not what felt comfortable to me, trusting God to that point is a really difficult thought or a difficult challenge. But I think it's because it's deeply true for all of us, right? The reality of what's going on here with the clay. We each come into the hands of God in the same condition as this piece of clay. It said that it had been marred, right? Which means to basically be scarred or scathed by uh, different circumstances through use or whatever it may be. And we uh, are marred coming into the hands of God. We've been seemingly thrown off from our original plan or what we thought our purpose was. We've been hurt by the world and by sin, both our own sin and the sin of others. And even as disciples, this plan hasn't gone exactly the way that we thought all of the time. And it's been harder to overcome sin as we originally envisioned, right? Especially as time goes on, you're like, this is going to be awesome. Like, I'm going to be a disciple. Everything's going to go great. Nothing's going to go bad for me. And then we find out that is not the case, right? And so much like Israel, I, I think we can really relate to the Israel that G God was speaking to here in this scripture. If you remember Israel's or God's original plan for Israel 
It was to populate the earth and fill his promised land so that he could walk with his people and fill their every need that God and his people would walk together. And it, he would release them from their worries and their cares so that they could essentially live as Adam and Eve did before sin came into the world, right? But Israel, this was my, uh, my quiet time yesterday. Israel, once they reached the border of the promised land, they were like literally on the brink. They give in to fear of the world and of the Amalekites that had filled the land that they were supposed to enter. And that fear gave birth to sin and rebellion against God. And from there, an entire generation was poisoned and they were beyond repair. God had to have them all die out before they could enter into the promised land. And he, he told Moses, all right, they're all going to die. Go and speak to the kids and tell the kids what they're going to have to be ready for. I'm like, imagine being one of those kids. You find out like, it's awesome. I get to go in the promised land, but you just told me my parents have to die first. You know what I mean? Like what? I would be filled with anxiety. I'd feel a lot of pressure. And we see that like, man, we can probably relate a lot with the Israelites here. You know, um, I think, you know, thinking of yourself, do you really trust God today? We see that a lot of their fear came from a lack of trust in God. Do you trust that the vessel that God is trying to mold you into is what's best for you? Do you care if it's what's best for God? Are you mo more focused on what you want to be made into than what God needs you to be? Because here it says that the, he, the potter was shaping it and forming it into what seemed best for him. And so that's what God is going to do with each and every one of us. He's going to form us into exactly what's best for him. And even though you might not think it's what's best for you, it is what's best for you. And Romans 9 verses 20 through 21, you don't have to turn there, but it says, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay pottery for special use and some for common use? And I'm like, man, when I first look at this, if you look at it, go and read the scripture in the message version, and it's essentially calling God a, an artist and that God through his art, he can make whatever he wants, right? Some of his art demonstrates his humor. Some of his art demonstrates his sadness. Some of his art demonstrates his compassion. And each and every one of us, we have this different characteristic of God or different use that God intends to use us for, but maybe we're looking at how someone else was formed and what they get to do. And we become jealous. Why didn't you make me like that? God, how come I don't get this role? God, how come that person is made for special use, but I'm made for common use. You know, why don't I get to be like them? And we can totally relate. And maybe you're fearful or you're uncomfortable with even the tools that God is using to mold you or to press and mold and bend. And certain tools that God can use, he uses tools like discipleship and giving us a real, a human or forcing us to give a human real authority in our life, right? Discipleship means nothing is off the table. That means things that we don't like to talk about, romantic relationships, purity, things like that money and how we budget our finances and not using our finances to what we think is best, but using our finances to what God thinks is best. What about humility? What about being discipled on your lack of love and your lack of forgiveness? What about when somebody hurts you, right? Another tool that God likes to use is failure. <laughs> we think that we learn that we learn the most through victories, but in reality, we learn the most through failure. And failure protects us from making bigger mistakes in the future. Not only our own failure, but God also uses the failure of others to teach you grace. The grace that God first showed you. He's trying to make you into an image of him by teaching you grace and purposefully putting people in your life who are going to fail you. Think about that again. God is putting you in a kingdom full of people who are going to sin against you and fail you. Does that mean that this isn't the kingdom anymore? No, it means that that's actually an example that God is working in your life and that God is active in your life. Another tool that he uses is light. 
light exposes the sin that we would prefer to keep hidden in the darkness, right? Um, there's another scripture that talks about uh, one of the things that can cause us to perish is fear of being exposed, right? That we'd rather keep those uh, those uh, embarrassing or sinful or regrettable uh, parts of our lives to ourselves and not expose them to the people that we know we should be exposing them to. It might be easy to tell your best friend who's not going to disciple you and is going to let you stay where you're at, which is that really a friend at all? I don't think so. But we're too afraid to share these things or we're too afraid to bring into the light these issues with the people that God has purposefully put in our lives to disciple us. And, but the, the reality is we forget who God is. God sees you. He knows you inside and out. God knows you better than anyone, better than yourself. You don't even know the first thing about you <laughs> in the eyes of God. God's like, you have no idea. You are so deceived. You're so blinded to what's really going on in your heart. He knows you better than your discipler knows you, than your family knows you, than your friends, than your husband. Maybe for those of the, for those who uh, get therapy, he knows you better than your therapist, right? Even though you can walk away from an appointment and be like, what the heck? I feel like this person knows me inside and out. God knows you better. And half the time, what you're hearing in those appointments was in the Bible first, right? And so if God knows you this much, you have to also trust that he's in complete control of the situation and he has you inside his hands, but we don't trust him, right? While this chaos and these trials are going on, God has you right here and he's doing it to you. He's applying a consistent amount of pressure until you become strong enough to push back. And then by that point, when you're strong enough, guess what he does? He does it again. He applies the pressure again so that he can increasingly make you more and more strong. Instead, are you trying to roll out of God's hands, right? Like, uh, I don't like how this feels. And you just tuck and roll, trust fall right off of the hands of God. <laughs> I think some, for some of us, the thought of real love, the thought of success, the thought of openness, healing, forgiveness, it's honestly too much for us to bear. It sounds awesome. But when we're really confronted with what it would take to get there, we would much rather, it's much easier to keep ourselves in the dark. It's easier to keep our hearts hardened. It's easier to keep people at a distance, Pe the people who love us the most. It's easier to keep God at a distance and have this superficial or shallow relationship with God. It's easier to stay comfortable and it's easier to remain alone. I think that's one thing that this isolation has revealed the most in a lot of us. And my first challenge for you guys tonight is to let God in. Stop closing yourself off from God's love and the love of the kingdom. Open yourself up to real help, real discipling, and real growth. This week, I want to encourage you to set up time with someone that you feel like you hardly know maybe you feel intimidated by, or that you just don't feel close with. And I want you to tell them your entire story. So set up a time, maybe you go to like a, a coffee shop or something like that, and you make a little appointment of it, right? But I want you to tell them where you've come from. I want you to tell them what you've had to overcome to be here, to be a disciple, and what you're currently struggling with in your discipleship. And finally, I want you guys to pray together. Use this time to not only grow close to each other, but to grow closer to God and to pray for each other, right? It's moments like this that you realize you really don't know anyone around here. If you haven't taken the time to get to know your sisters, not only are, do I guarantee you aren't praying for them, how are they going to pray for you if they don't even know what's going on in your life? We feel so alone and we feel like there's nobody there to help us, but it takes the humility of you actually letting somebody into your life and asking for help. And so I want to encourage you guys with that first challenge, but that's not all. My second point is refined by fire. And so there's this process when you're, when you're making pottery and it's called firing. And it's the process that the clay and glaze must go through in the kiln in order to become solid and refined. 
And do you know what it's called when the pottery has come to the completion in the firing process, right? The finished product is called mature. And I'm like, oh, what? So after you're put in through the Whoa. fire, it's until you, the, the pottery has become mature or until the point that it's reached its optimal level of melting, right? And so I think of like a softened heart that we've, we've melted, that, that hardened heart that was inside of us. But how are we made mature through the fire according to the scriptures? Let's go over to James chapter one. This is awesome, Devin. Let's go, Devin. In James chapter one, we're going to be reading verses two through four. And it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so according to the scripture, it talks about trials. It says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And I don't know about you guys, but I think for every single person here, none of us gets fired up about a trial, right? <laughs> I can guarantee that all of us hate trials. That's why they're called True. trials. Just look up the definition and it's bad. But the fire of trials in our lives produces character if we you've learned nothing. You've gained zero maturity through those trials. Gaining character through these trials comes through perseverance or turning to righteousness instead. The definition of perseverance is long suffering. So in Job, it says, uh, beware of turning to sin, which you seem to prefer to affliction. And so God is helping us to understand these afflictions in our lives are necessary but they're necessary to teach us true conviction or true character. It's the difference between somebody getting a car when they're five and somebody getting a car when they're 18, right? I don't think any of us would give a car to a five-year-old and trust them to drive it around the block. And, but, you know, by the time we get our license and we go through driver's ed, now we have the character that we need to be able to handle this blessing that God has given us. But I think some of us, we'd rather skip the trials and go straight to the blessing. But you're asking God to give you a car as a five-year-old. And so you might think this is super exciting and this is exactly what you need right now. Like when I was young, my favorite video games were the driving video games. So when we'd go to like the arcade or something, I was always the one pedal to the metal. Whoa! And I'd usually crash my car every single time. And I did it in the video game and later in real life. So I had to learn my lesson. But I think if any of us was given a real car at that age, it would not be a blessing. It would be a curse. It would result in disaster, right? It would hurt us more than it would make us happy. This is why God is encouraging us to persevere through trial so that you can develop the character to actually receive that blessing that you're praying for in your life. God has a purpose behind the character or conviction that he's producing in you to handle those blessings. But how does God ensure that this character or this conviction has taken root in our lives? Let's look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 12 through 13. And the Bible reads, If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And I think once more... God tells us he's not only going to produce conviction through the fire, but he's also going to test conviction through fire. 
whatever fire God was using to try and produce character in you, he's going to continue to throw that same thing in your life until you've learned your lesson. So maybe you feel like, man, like I've just had nothing but hardship in my life, right? Things have not gone well for me. And I feel like God just keeps hitting me with the same thing over and over and over again. Well, now you know why. Have you produced the conviction? Have you learned the lesson that God is trying to teach you? Because if you haven't, you're going to continue to fall on your face over and over and over again until you do, until you turn to righteousness rather than sin. If, if after that fire, if we find that we're lacking anything, right? Our foundation is purified through the fire. So it burns away these things in our foundation that can rot the foundation and actually create holes and instability in our foundation. And so what does this mean? What kind of things are, are made or built into a firm foundation? I think a security that's based on the promises of God rather than the praise of man. Some of us get our security from what people say about us or how much we're thanked or lifted up, but uh, true conviction is getting your security from the promises of God that we don't need recognition. We don't need the praise of man. We don't need these things to feel secure, right? We don't need validation from people. We've already got our validation from God. I think a faith that withstands any circumstance rather than a faith defined by our circumstance. Man, when all of us got those stimulus checks, how were you feeling? Were you feeling super secure? Were you feeling super faithful that God finally came through for you in this big way? Well, how are you feeling right before that, that stimulus check came? Were you feeling like, where is God? Why isn't he looking at me? Why hasn't he recognized me? That means that your faith d- is determined by your circumstances instead of withstanding the circumstances. Real faith is not determined by our circumstances. We don't believe the hype and get super sucked into the highs, but we also don't get sucked into the lows. We find ourselves steady as a rock, no matter what's going on in our lives. Another important part of our foundation is love. A love that is not conditional to what we may receive back, but unconditional like that of Jesus. So many of us, even myself, this was something I was learning recently where I was just like, I was having a really hard time, right? And I was, I was meeting, I was talking with my mentor, my discipler. And I was just like, man, what's going on with me? And she was discipling me. And she's like, Devin, you don't realize that you still expect something. You're having a really hard time loving in this situation because you're not getting the recognition that you feel like you deserve. You're not getting the approval that you feel like you deserve. You're not getting the affirmation, but she's like, that's not, that shouldn't be why you're loving at all. If you're loving the way that Jesus loved, he was praying for the people who were nailing him to the cross. He was praying for God to forgive them for they didn't know what they were doing. And so that's not biblical love at all. If you expect something to be returned, Jesus said that we would forgive not seven times, but 77 times, right? That means that it it does not matter what a person could do to you, but that you would continue to forgive. And forgiveness isn't just letting things go. It's actually extending grace to that person. It's not like, okay, I'm over it, but now we're going to have a little distance between us and you got to earn my love. No, it means that now I'm going to bring you in closer, right? I'm going to love you like family. I'm going to give you the love that you don't deserve, but that I, you deserve from me because of what Jesus did for me, right? These are important foundations or important factors in having a firm foundation in our relationship with God. And what's most important in our faith is not so much what we're doing, but why we're doing it, what we, what we're building on, right? These parts of our foundation, they produce actions of faith, but it's not so much what we're doing, but it's that heart that it's coming from, right? This is not an excuse to stop being obedient. If you feel like your foundation isn't completely clear. Because as it says in James, faith without deeds is dead. So it doesn't mean that we, that we now have a license to stop obeying. But 
we need to see what does this process produce as like a final product, right? If we allow ourselves to be refined by the fire. Uh, let's go over to 1 Peter chapter one. Let's go, Devin. Come on, Devin. Let's go, Devin. In 1 Peter chapter one, we're gonna start in verse six. And it says, in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. What does this produce in us? A true joy. Do you guys remember the first scripture you ever looked at when you studied the Bible? It was Psalm 119 verses one through two. And it talked about being blessed. Do you guys remember what that word blessed means? It means superlatively happy or joyful in any circumstance. And the result of allowing yourself to be refined by fire is true happiness, joy that withstands any circumstance. And it says the guarantee of your salvation. So salvation that you can be sure of. I don't know about you guys, but for me, I grew up in the church, but before I became a disciple, I was never sure of my salvation. I grew up in a church where we play, prayed Jesus into our heart. And I did that about five times because I was never sure that the last time took, I was like, I prayed Jesus into my heart, had a terrible sinful year, went back to church camp, prayed Jesus into my heart again, even worse. The next year I showed up to church camp high and I prayed Jesus into my heart again, hoping for a different response. But the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. But it was when I studied the Bible, when I did something different, that there was finally a change in me. And now I have a salvation that I am positive of, not emotionally or because of what I've experienced, but because I can explain it to you through the scriptures, right? And I have a joy that surpasses any circumstance. I could get diagnosed with cancer today and I could still have a reason to be joyful. I could win the lottery and I wouldn't become like, you know, lost in the sauce, but I would just maintain the joy because I would be surrendered to God no matter what happens. And so no more doubt, no more emotional roller coasters, just an inexpressible and a glorious joy. And the final part of this process, point number three is tested under pressure. Let's go to second Corinthians chapter four. Thanks. Come on, Devin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to read verses 6 through 12. And the Bible reads, For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the, the light of knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus's sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And I love this scripture um, because it, it lets us in a little bit more on these jars of clay that we've become, right? So far, we've gone through being molded and hard pressed and softened and, and molded into this, this image or this vessel. Then we've gone through the fire to bring us to this point of maturity, right? This mature joy, this mature conviction. And now we're at the point of being tested, right? And it says that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that it, this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. But what is this treasure, right? Um, the treasure is the light of the gospel as referenced in verse four, but no matter what kind of vessel God has created you into, we all have the same purpose though, po possibly through different functions, right? And so if we have this light of the gospel within us, 
And it's meant to be the light of the world, right? So somehow it's got to come out of us. But God chooses to use our delicate clay vessels. And I don't know about you guys, but I feel like that perfectly describes my heart as a delicate piece of clay that is easily broken, right? I'm weak. And he also tells us that our delicate clay selves are going to endure great pressure, but not be crushed, that they're going to be knocked down, but not completely destroyed. How could this possibly happen, right? How is the light going to get to the rest of the world? As it says in Matthew 5, 15, people don't hide a light under a bowl. So in order for us to understand how this is going to happen, we first have to understand why it's going to happen. Turn with me over to Judges chapter seven, and we're going to look at the story of Gideon. If you guys are familiar with Gideon's story, he was a guy who was greatly enslaved to fear, right? He had so much fear that when God found him, he was hiding in a wine press, threshing his wheat because he was so afraid that if he did anything out in public, everything was going to be stolen from him. And this was his last piece of food that he had left. But he triumphantly conquered his fear as well as many of the enemies of God. God called Gideon a great warrior from day one. And over time, you see Gideon become this amazing warrior. And so God refined him through fire. But we're going to see an example of God testing the conviction that Gideon has shown to have, right? We zero in on this battle against the Midianites. And after God had whittled down uh, Gideon's army, right? He had this amazing army and God continued to whittle and whittle and whittle it down until it became just 300 men to go against the entire Midianite army. And so this was a testing of his faith and his trust in God that they could still be victorious with such a small number of people. And God gives him some unique direction. After all of that, he also gives him a crazy plan on how they're going to be victorious. And so when the point that we're going to come in on is that they're approaching the outskirts of the opposing army with nothing in their hands, but a trumpet and a lantern. And the army was instructed to do exactly as Gideon did. So in Judges 7, let's pick it up in verse 19 and see what they did. Starting in verse 19, it says, Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets. They were to blow, they, they were to blow, they shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran crying out as they fled. So in this situation, it might be a little confusing, but essentially the, the, these uh, warriors of Gideon, right, of Gideon's army, they were called to go out on the battlefield with nothing but a lantern and a trumpet. And that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> but what they were going to do is they were going to, they had, because it says that they had a lantern, a trumpet, but that they also had a jar of clay because they had to smash the jar of clay. What was going on is they would have like a torch and the jar of clay covered the fire so that they could sneak up on the army in the night. And then what they were supposed to do right before they attacked is they would smash the clay jar. All of a sudden, this light would come out of nowhere. They'd blow the trumpets and they'd make a ton of noise. And so they'd present to be a much greater army than they actually were. At first, this plan sounds crazy. But what was even crazier was that the Midianites ran out crying because they were so terrified of what had just happened. And so th the minute that the jars were broken and the trumpets were blown, God brought victory for Gideon's army. And the reality is, if, if we've learned anything from the previous scriptures that we just looked at, we are those jars of clay. And through allowing ourselves to be broken, we are victorious in our efforts to seek and save the lost. We were made to be broken. And by doing so, we allow the light of God to shine in the world around us. But in 2 Corinthians 4, it said that we would, be, we would not be crushed, right? And it, this shows us that there's a difference between, between being broken and being crushed. 
I'm going to share with you guys something. I'm going to try to share my screen. But I don't know if you guys have heard of the Japanese art of kintsugi. And I looked up how to pronounce this so that I would say it the right way. But it's the ancient Japanese art of mending broken objects with gold. And it teaches us that if we choose to embrace our struggles or imperfect and repair ourselves with love, we become more beautiful for having been broken. As an, as an example, here's some examples of pieces of pottery that have been mended with gold after being broken into pieces, right? But what's crazy is it doesn't just stop there. They also, in some pieces of, of pottery, they would take pieces from other broken vessels and include them. And so what's amazing is just when, it, when you thought it couldn't get more beautiful, this unique addition of taking a broken piece from another piece of pottery and perfectly placing it in the bowl or the vessel that was being mended, it makes it that much more unique, that much more beautiful. And so what's amazing about this process is that not only through being broken are we made more beautiful, right? In Job 23, verse 10, he says, yet he knows the way I have taken. When, when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. So after being broken and tested, Job said he's going to come forth as gold. In 1 Peter verse 1 or chapter 1 verse 7, it says of greater worth than gold, right? That this faith or this confidence or this conviction that God is producing within us after being broken, um, it, it makes us that much more beautiful. In the pieces where these broken vessels, they're including another part. I'm going to get into a little bit of that later, but it tells us that parts of our broken pieces aren't even meant for us. They're actually meant for other people. In reality, the mending is just as important as the breaking in God's process of producing maturity in our discipleship. Breaking produces strength as well as humility and mending produces love as well as gratitude. Over time, some of us as disciples have been broken, but we've not allowed ourselves to be mended through God's love, right? turning instead to sin or comfort or idols or to find our healing, right? But I don't know if you guys are familiar, if you've broken a bone and it's healed the wrong way, right? Like at, at the wrong angle, the only way to fix it is to re-break it again. And this is part of what God is trying to do within us. Many of us has, have come tonight feeling broken or have this crooked understanding of God's love. We've We've healed the wrong way and it's creating resistance or a lack of harmony between us and the kingdom, between us and God. When you don't heal the right way, you find resistance in your discipleship. You find an inability to live in harmony with the disciples around you. You constantly have this resistance. And I want to encourage you, I, my, my final challenge tonight is to allow God to mend your broken pre pieces through prayer. I want to encourage you, uh, if you're not familiar with this story, I want to encourage you to go and look at the story of Jesus praying in Gethsemane. And he had this spot where he would go and pray, right? It also says that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus would go out and he would pray. I want to encourage you, find your Gethsemane spots this week and pray to God for a full hour. If you're already praying for an hour, pray for two. I need like three hours of prayer because I got a whole lot going on in these emotions. Am I right? And so I want to encourage you, let everything out, put everything on the, on the, on the table. One thing I use, um, if anyone uh, is curious about needing help to draw out your emotions, I use something called a feelings wheel to really identify what it is I'm feeling so that I can better clean out my cup before God in prayer. But I want, you to, I want to encourage you to let everything out so that you can see clearly what God is trying to teach you during this time, as well as remind yourself of everything that God's done up until this point, right? We might be struggling a lot right now, but you can't completely disregard everything God has already done. In fact, meditating on these things can give you encouragement 
that he's working in your life now just as much as he was working through all of those previous moments. I also want to encourage you that there are lost women out there who need your broken pieces to make them more complete and more beautiful before God. So go out into the world and find a soul who needs mending. As disciples, we are called to be fishers of men. If you're not fishing for people, you cannot call yourself a disciple. It's as simple as that. I don't feel afraid to say that because it's clear within the scriptures. But what's amazing is if you can take this courage, right, that I may be broken, but there is a soul out there that needs my broken peace. I don't even know why this thing happened to me in my life until I started studying the Bible with this woman. And it turns out she went through the exact same thing. And where I found healing, she has not yet found healing. And I can place my broken peace in her heart to make it that much more beautiful and it all binding together with the gold of God's love. I want to encourage you to set up a study this week and see who God is bringing into your life and how you can use your story to plant the light in their vessel as well. I, I'm so happy that I was able to preach with you guys tonight or preach the word to you guys tonight. I hope you took something out of the lesson. I hope that you guys have an amazing rest of your week. I can't wait to see the new faces that come as we go and share our faith and find more vessels for God. I love you guys so much. And thank you so much for letting me preach. Let's go. Devin. Great job, Devin.